there are some red flags out there for the um, risk of the market, but there's also a lot more confidence that as people get vaccinated um, and the amount of COVID goes down, we should start to see a better economy. Welcome back to another edition of From Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falco Becali, your host. And before we get to our guest, let me first of all thank you for all of your support, your suggestions, your thumbs up, your likes, your sharing, everything there. And also that you're subscribing to the YouTube channel and also that you are hitting the bell button so I can always keep you informed. You've been so proactive, so communicative. Keep it up. We love it and we definitely co-create and integrate all of your ideas if and when we can. Today, we are going to talk about the COVID-19 crisis and how it really impacts asset managers. I mean, look at the markets. Ever since the crisis started, the markets have done very, very well, almost in all of the asset classes. But what happens if you have to have a long-term asset management investment strategy, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a crisis where there's a little bit of volatility or just something that might not have been part of your long-term strategy? And how does this crisis we are seeing right now compare to other crises? For example, the one in 2000, dot-com bubble, 2008-9, the financial crisis, and also, of course, 9-11, and we had 2015-16, the European sovereign debt crisis. How does what we're seeing right now really feel to asset managers? So I thought, why not reaching out to Edward Bowser? Edward Bowser, he's been with the Vanguard Wellington Funds for 20 years. For 17 years, he's been the lead manager of the equity part. And that means he was responsible for more than 90 billion US dollars in assets under management. And I can tell you one thing, <laughs> he's lived through quite a few crises and managed very well. Edward, thank you so much for being with us here on Mentory TV. Well, thank you for having me. Well, listen, Edward, you left Vanguard um, in June 2020. And that was really when we started uh, understanding that the COVID-19 pandemic would stay around for a while and definitely already showed quite a bit of an impact on the markets. Were you happy to be out? <laughs> or would you have loved to have stayed on, taken on the challenge as an equity manager and ridden out a perfect storm? We well, you know I, I actually have gotten a lot of... Uh, personal satisfaction from dealing with so many crises. You listed many of them. Um, my first one was in 1987 when we had the crash and I was very early in my career. Um, and it is fascinating how each and every crisis, the um, US Fed has come to the rescue. Uh, we've worked our way out of it and we've ended up higher within months or maybe a couple of years. So this one in particular was different in that we all had to work from home. And that made it harder um, for me personally, just because I benefit so much from interactions with my colleagues, with company management, with the sell side, um, all providing valuable inputs for me. So this would have been a different one, but um, I am quite excited about where we are in the market today. Um, less so um, last June, just because we are in a period of um, tremendously low interest rates. We had um, the challenges of um, whether the economy would be able to pick up when we'd all go back to work. It was very uncertain. I feel a lot more confident today about where I think the market is than I did back then. So perhaps I am lucky that I retired when I did. Yeah, well, you have retired, but you're still invested in the markets, I'm quite sure, being such an expert. So do you actually think that we are really getting a lot more transparency? Because what we've seen uh, in terms of the reaction from the central banks and also from the fiscal side was very similar to the previous crises. Yes, that's right. We, we had more stimulus this time, both fiscal and monetary. Um, in fact, this really stands out. If you think about all the other crises we've had going back to 2000, it's almost all been monetary stimulus, which led the markets higher. This one, we had the, uh, the, the fiscal stimulus, which was really quite remarkable, which really kept everyone um, who was out of work able to 
to live. And it worked quite well in terms of that. So um, what we're left now, however, is with a lot of um, fiscal deficit, more so than we've seen ever before. So there are some red flags out there for the um, risk of the market, but there's also a lot more confidence that as people get vaccinated um, and the amount of COVID goes down, we should start to see a better economy. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance. And let's get back to the conversation. The red flag. Let's get into that a little bit more, Edward. Let's talk about the debt level because even before this crisis or even the previous one, we were always talking about, you know, the cliff, the fiscal cliff, and right. that the US is definitely over leveraged for the kind of GDP they continue to produce. Right. Well, the, the challenge we have right now is that the debt is very high, but the interest payments are thankfully very low because interest rates are being managed. And I don't think any of us really have a great life experience with having such a managed interest rate market. And if we do have a nice recovery in the economy and the Fed doesn't need to be supportive, then interest rates could creep even higher than they have in recent weeks. And that starts to increase the cost of having such a large deficit. Yeah, and that is a risk. And if, I mean, today we have to kind of stamp our, our recording is the 23rd of February. And yesterday we had a bit of a wobble in the market, to say the least, when uh, all of a sudden people are saying, okay, things might be looking a little bit better on the vaccination front, on the COVID front. However, what about inflation? Right. No, inflation was quite low last year. It was 0.62% lower than in recent years. Um, but it's definitely picking up. Um, we hear anecdotally about the housing market across various regions. Um, we're seeing tightness in supplies and materials. Um, you know, some of the best stocks have been materials companies. And we finally are seeing the oil markets recover to a higher price than we've seen in a couple of years. So something's going on, and that is inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll go and talk about oil and what's been happening on that front also a little later on. But that conundrum I'm really interested in um, uh, because on one hand, you have huge debt, which is okay to service as long as the interest rates stay low. But as soon as you start, you know, sniffing inflation, of course, interest rates are moving against it, making the debt repayment more expensive. So right. is that kind of, you know, getting us to a stagflationary, potentially stagflationary scenario? Or I'm totally off the point. Well, presumably, as we get a better economy, we'll generate more tax revenue, which helps offset some of this deficit. Um, but the magnitude of the debt now is so significant that I'm not sure we can have a strong enough economy to offset it like we might have in, in the past. So uh, it is a concern. Um, the U.S. has been quite aggressive in managing the crisis through monetary and fiscal. Yep. Um, and presumably, once we get through the, uh, the COVID-19 problem, we're going to have to deal with the deficit firsthand. And it's a concern. Yeah. It's hard it to predict how it will play out. Yeah, absolutely. Coming back to the markets, which is, which is uh, really your expertise, not that macro isn't, of course, <laughs> Edward, just, don't get me wrong here. I prepared a couple of screen shares, some shots, and let me see where they are if I find them. Mm, yes, there. And I want to take you through them because, and everybody else, because it is quite remarkable and it shows what we were talking about. And this is what I, I would like you to comment on it. And, you know, in my wonderful visuals that I <laughs> draw by hand and then screenshot, we have here the MSAI World Index and the way it basically reacted. And you were in these markets managing the equities. So the dot-com and 9-11, we were up here. And that was basically the result of those two, of those two incidences in the market. 
Right. Then we kind of got our act together, 2000 and Greenspan, Greenspan, ultra, ultra uh, low interest rate policy. He served uh, as a Fed chairman, I think, until 2006, building up what we then called a nice asset bubble, the housing bubble, the crisis right. pops, and woof, off we go. Managing right. a fund <laughs> all the way through. And then we come here to the EU sovereign debt. And then we come here to the Trump rally, even during his, uh, you know, during to the run up uh, to the election and then post election. And his, here is where COVID 19 hit a little bit of a dip compared. And now we are very close to all time highs. Tell me, what was your strategy here? How did your fund, you personally, react to these kind of incidences? Well, if you go back to the dot-com bubble, um, it's worth telling listeners that I'm a value manager. Um, my strategy has always been to identify companies that are being underestimated by the market, where valuations are reasonable, and where supply and demand fundamentals are likely to be good. And if you think back to the dot-com bubble, the supply and demand for dot-com companies, there is way too much supply. And it was just way too early in the, the history of the internet to um, have that be satisfactory. Ironically, 20 years later, we now know that the internet had tremendous demand and, and it did work out over the 20 year period, but it wasn't going to work out over the two or three year period after 2000. And if you think back to that exact same period, oil prices were roughly 10 to $20 a barrel the companies were disinvesting from exploration and we had China emerging. So the, the correct answer was actually to get out of technology and buy oil and commodities to play the emergence of China, which wasn't really that obvious to, to a lot of people. The other thing that happened in 2002 was that we had had tremendous um, investment by the Fed in the housing industry. They really stimulated housing. And housing took off in 2003. You can see by this graph that we had quite a run in the market, but we created too much housing. We had people speculating in housing. People were flipping houses. They were getting um, interest-free mortgages in the first year, um, being incentivized by the, the financial companies. And we also had um, just speculation and all these instruments that ended up going belly up, yep. which led to the financial crisis. So coming out of the financial crisis, again, we had um, quite a bit of stimulus because interest rates went to new lows, lows we hadn't seen in, in 40 years. And with interest rates that low, we created an environment for growth stock investing because growth stocks <clears throat> were huge beneficiaries of earnings in the future, which got discounted back at lower rates. Um, we actually had the emergence of the FANG stocks, which really became so dominant in social media. And we created really an enormous cycle, one that maybe we've never seen before. Um, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, all beneficiaries of, of the internet, which finally really became dominant in the economy. As we got into this um, European crisis, um, it wasn't really that uh, material compared to these other crises we had that we've talked about already, but it was scary just because the financial institutions in Europe own the, uh, the debt, the sovereign debt of the, uh, the countries in Europe, and they were vulnerable. And uh, really Europe went into a tremendous bit of stagnation, which um, really continued until very recently. So. Um, when Trump came in and it was really a pro um, business um, period, that really stimulated um, the stock market in terms of thinking about what might be the upside as opposed to the downside. So we really had quite a nice run in, in, in business for that, that period. But we also had COVID, which really um, kind of neutralized the Trump pro-business activity. And um, then the Fed stepped in massively mm -hmm. combined with all the, um, the fiscal stimulus. And then here we are today at a, at a new high 
in one that was not obvious a year ago when it looked like the world was coming to an end. So yep. um, that over is- and over, we have seen what the Fed can do to the market, but we also have seen in the aftermath of this that there is usually a substantial correction ahead. So yep. that that stands to reason. And really the point of your question, it stands to reason we'll have another substantial correction at some point. Absolutely. And this is exactly what I was thinking because of the stimulus and the financial crisis. And you mentioned the housing uh, bubble and the speculation where, you know, with all due respect, a taxi driver that earns 60,000 US dollars a year would be able to buy uh, a house for six, seven hundred thousand dollars you know, not being even able, if, if there had been the minimum amount of interest rates to actually pay the interest rates in any kind of normal market or with normal interest rates. So this is exactly the reasoning behind my question. And now we are looking at what you would like to look at, because I asked you in our conversation before, well, Edward, what what is really striking you as of late in the market? And what I pulled out is the um, WTI, the oil price, and the way it fared. And I think it went below to uh, below zero uh, straight right. at the beginning, I don't know, March last year, and then came yeah. back up. And actually, we had a really good rally as of the last few weeks. What's happening there? Why are people all of a sudden unexcited about oil and then super excited about oil? Well, we have the the prospect of a better economy with, with the COVID vaccine. I think that's certainly a factor. But as I highlighted earlier with supply and demand, when oil went, to zero, um, the companies really had to just drop their capital spending massively. And it really started to constrain supply for the first time. Oil um, companies historically are always bullish. And they, they typically always overspend in terms of supply. And it's one reason why there's always plenty of oil around. The, um, the fact that China emerged in the early 2000s really was something that changed that, allowed oil to go over $100 a barrel. But that was really almost a, um, a, a factor that none of the oil people really ever had thought of before. And in fact, once they got oil over $100 a barrel, you can see back in 2014 that um, the price just collapsed and stayed down. Yes. So um, we're now in a period where the oil industry is under tremendous financial pressure. And they really are in no position to significantly increase their capital spending right away because they have to offset all the losses they've had in the last year or two. So I expect that if the economy were to continue to pick up, that oil prices could go, could go even higher. That's a really interesting one because, as you were just saying, I'm going to stop the screen share for a moment and make us big again and then going to go back to another screen share. Because you were saying the oil industry is in, in a big transformation. Of course, it's, it's all about going green. It's going sustainable, zero to emission. So what they have or what we have is actually a, a transitional period where without energy, you don't do anything. But energy companies have to invest more and more into their clean energy production capacities while still servicing the market. How difficult is that? And what sort of impact would that have about anybody wanting to invest in oil? Well, the hard thing is so many investors around the world are divesting their oil investments. So fewer and fewer people actually are willing to invest in oil, which really is managing the capital that is provided to the traditional oil industry. You mentioned that there's clean energy, there's wind and solar and possibly nuclear, but it's not, it's not something that the oil companies are really set up to do themselves. So you have capital leaving the traditional oil industry by independent investors who are putting it into wind and solar. And it's really causing the returns for oil companies to have to go up in order to keep people in that business. So arguably, the oil business should become very profitable in order to keep any capital at all in it because so many people are divesting. So it would not surprise me if the oil business actually became a pretty good business. It reminds me a little bit about tobacco. As we all know, tobacco is not good for your health, but yet Philip Morris and Altria have made a lot of money in the last 20 years harvesting that business 
and it keeps other people out. So um, you could you could argue there's a scenario where the oil business could be more profitable than people expected, despite these overwhelmingly bad fundamentals. But that's that's really interesting. So for those that stay with the traditional fuel um, producers, there might be an upside potential if they invest in it simply because the, the, the challenges are so high for the industry, they have to become more efficient, i.e. more profitable, at least for a certain stretch of time, while they still do. finding... Yeah, okay. But still yeah, but finding... They can't really invest in the future because they have no future. Yeah. That's, that, yeah, exactly. That's the point. So I'm just thinking, if they, if they reduce their cost, all right, to become more efficient, will they really be able to reward me as an investor with dividends? Or will they pack that money, that capital, you know, into CapEx going towards the new technologies, going towards the zero to emission and eventually catching up because they have to? Yeah, I think possibly the largest companies, the BPs, Exxon, Chevrons, they have the wherewithal to think about doing that. But the rest of the industry is too fragmented to think about doing that. So that aspect of supply will be very constrained. Hmm. I think you need needs to have a, a very sophisticated view in, in, in that and in staying in, a, in an asset class that quite clearly is being dropped by governments, by the UN, <laughs> you know, quite a bit right now. And if you socially look, responsible investors. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And this is exactly the point I wanted to get into, uh, Edward, is the ESG investment. And Larry Fink from BlackRock, he made it very, very clear that, you know, the times of greenwashing are over, that there is... Is he believes strongly in stakeholder capitalism, meaning he's listening to his clients in how to manage money and that all of his 7.4 trillion US dollars worth of assets will have somewhere at some point an ESG angle to it. I mean, that's the right. way to go. Yeah, I'm a big believer in ESG investing in that companies that are responsible tend to do a better job for the investors as well. Um, they have fewer scandals. There are fewer uh, environmental problems. Um, presumably, they'll have better governance, better uh, accounting. So all these, all these aspects of ESG, I think, raise the bar for management. And it's healthy. And companies that employ more women tend to make better decisions. So there's all sorts of reasons. Really? To, Do to they? <laughs> in, um, in, in ESG. It's, I think it's a positive for business, not not just the cost. Yeah, I, I think it is a positive as well. Um, and if, if I look at your experience, Edward, you know, if you manage a fund together with those uh, that manage the fixed income part and you the equity part, you see these kind of shift in zeitgeist. How easy or difficult is it for you to adjust your investment strategy for your investors? Well, when you're running a large fund like I, I have been running for many years, it, we move very glacially. So it is, it is hard to move on a dime. And, you know, you have very tough decisions to make. For example, when um, COVID hit, and it was obvious that interest rates were going to stay low for even longer. Um, I could have done one of two things. I could have st stood pat, which is probably what I would have done. Or I could have moved um, a bit more aggressively into growth on the argument that, of course, interest rates are lower, that's good for growth. And yet, a year later, when COVID's over and the economy picks up and interest rates go back up, I'd have to move the entire portfolio back to where it needed to be. So in some ways, as a large investor, you have to be willing to live through periods of time when you're just going to be out of favor. Yeah, and and It's very frustrating and, yeah. and your clients are a bit disappointed in you. But it is, it is a fact of life that you just can't move the money around over and over. Well, this is, I guess, why you do the profiling of uh, your potential investors anyway. I mean, if you are a certain type of fund and you're a balanced fund and you have, let's say, 60% or 65% in equities and the rest in fixed income, then your investor knows, okay, the risk is at a certain limit. So the reward potentially will be a lot less than if you just go just growth. So right. the value part does cost you a little bit uh, more in terms of uh, a return on your investment but you might sleep a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is to smooth out 
actual returns, not relative returns. So the approach I've historically followed has fairly smooth overall returns, which tends to keep um, investors in the fund because the worst mistake an investor can make is selling at the bottom. <laughs> and, and most retail investors, after a really rough year, are tempted to sell a fund because they're disappointed, obviously. But if you can manage their expectations and maybe go up a little bit less in speculative markets, but go down a whole lot less in down markets, um, you can keep them invested and you actually benefit them as um, long-term holders of financial assets. Yeah, it's like preservation, capital preservation, rather than really going for big, big returns in a falling market. Well, the, the hard part for any investor is when you sell, getting back in. So that's, that's really what you're trying to prevent is having them to make two decisions. Just stay involved, stay in the market over the long run. Yeah, no, I, I think you're so spot on when to get in the market. And that triggers me, Edward, to share another screen with uh, you and everybody else that is curious. Here, price-earning ratios. I looked at them this morning, 23rd of February, 21. Peloton. And I picked out those names that are household names by now. Price earning ratio, 1,800. Shopify, 880. Zoom, 505. Infineon, 140. At least Infineon has decent, uh, has decent income um, and profits and uh, also, um, well, just, just what, what they give in terms of dividends. All right. These are price earning ratios that are... You know, you could argue, are they mad? Are they not? How do they come about? And how would you, as an asset manager, react to, hey, the market is going towards technology, remote training, fit tech, blah de blah de blah We need to get in there. And then you look at this number and go like, okay, wow, am I too late? What about my timing? And that wraps up the first part of my conversation with Edward Bowser about how to manage funds long-term in a crisis. <laughs> 